All right. How many of you have been enjoying the messages this week? You've been enjoying the messages this week. How many of you are going to share some of what you've heard um, when you go back to your, your churches and to your local communities? Let me see your hands. Yeah. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm going to go back and share. I'm going to go back and share. And that, that doesn't mean that you have to remember all the sermons or all the messages or all the songs or what have you. There may be something that impressed you, something that blessed you, something that lifted you up, something that drew you to Christ, something that, that lightened your load, something that says, voila, or eureka, something has gone off in my mind based on what I've heard, based on what I've experienced, and my life has changed. It has been, it has been adjusted. It has been moved in a new direction, in, in, a, in a positive direction. And, and that's what you want to share with, with the world around you. But, it, but also, when you do share, it becomes a form of advertisement. I'm going to say av advertisement. Because then, next year, the people that you tell would most likely attend because you have been a very powerful spokesperson. You have been a first, uh, a, 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 an eyewitness, a first eyewitness to what you experienced. And of course, because of that, you'll be able to share with those around you. So next year, of course, I'm not going to be here, but I hope that it, that it goes to the next level and that uh, <laughs> I would be glad to come back. No problem. I've enjoyed myself. It was great meeting so many of you, and I've had an awesome, awesome experience with you and with, and with Christ. So hope you go back and, and share all of the good things that you, that you did experience. Now, I don't know, know if you have your Bible with you tonight. If you could take your Bible with you, we're going to John. We've been spending some time in the book of Mark uh, because there are were, there were a couple of stories that were interconnected. The, the book of John, John chapter 5, we want to read there um, in verse 1 and onward. Um, it's, it's about nine verses. I'll be as quick as possible. Here's what the Bible says in verse 1. Have you found it? If you, say, if you found it, just say amen. Amen. Uh, the Bible says, after this, there was a feast of the, of the, of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there, was, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called which, 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 which is called in Hebrew, sorry, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel, in verse 4, went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a man, verse 5, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there or lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick, the sick man answered him saying, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm in, while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. Shall we bow our heads before we start? Father, we're so grateful for this awesome privilege to be here in this room. We're grateful, O Lord, for your word that speaks to us night after night throughout this entire week. And we thank you that we have this privilege, this front row seat, to receive another blessing from your word. So I pray that you will speak to me so I can speak to your people so that when we do hear the word, your word will challenge our hearts, that it will get us to a place where we be, become changed because of that word through the power of your spirit. So speak now because your servant's here. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been speaking this week about certain men or a certain woman or a certain group. And here is another certain man that we're speaking of. Interestingly, the Bible speaks of the fact that <clears throat> here's a man who is sick, whatever the infirmity is, of 38 years. The Bible says that he's there with other lame people, those who are lame, those who are, are broken, who, those who are paralyzed. They're all in the same place together. Quite like all of us in this room, all of us have some kind of malady or some kind of issue or some kind of challenge that we're facing at times in our lives. 
You could look at yourself and say that my challenge is X, Y, Z. Another person's challenge might be something dissimilar from yours. Because we're all different individuals, because we came from different families, we came from different places, we came from different circumstances, the challenges that you have might be dissimilar to someone else and vice versa. And you can imagine that all of us are like these persons who are here in this, in this verse, those who are lame, those who are sick. And the Bible gives those descriptions of individuals who were sitting there representing those who could not help themselves. Those who are maimed, they can't get up and walk. Those who are blind, they can't see for themselves. Those who are hurt, they can't heal themselves. Uh, uh, scholars believe that this portico place or with these five porches where people would come, this was a place where people came because they were seeking mercy. And just to back up a bit, the name Bethesda, the meaning of Bethesda is house of mercy. Everybody say house of mercy. And, and, and the idea is that they come to this place because they could not go to another place. They could not go any other place so that they could receive mercy through their difficult season in life. It, it, I have to stop here parenthetically and say to every single one of us that when we're, that when we're going through our own issue, when we're going through our own challenge, when we're going through our own issue that in, in life that we have no control over, that we cannot fix by ourselves, that we cannot impact by, are you all with me today? That we cannot impact by ourselves, that there is one who understands and who is clearly in tune with the infirmities that we have. The Bible says in Hebrews that we, ha we, are, we, are, we, we have a high priest who is in touch with the feelings of our infirmities. What that simply says is that he is connected to what you're going through. In other words, he's not disconnected by what you're going through. He's not someplace else thinking uh, about something else as opposed to thinking about you. He is in touch when you're going through your pain. Are you all with me tonight? He's in touch when you're going through your brokenness. Uh, 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 some of you are not even saying that you understand what I'm, what I'm talking about. So can I jump into your Kool-Aid a little bit more tonight? Can, can I hang out with you and sit next to you? He's in touch when, you're, when, you're, when you are trying to gain the attention of someone in your life. <clears throat> and, 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 and you simply can't make it happen. He's in touch with that. He's in touch when you're going through a painful experience. Are you all with me? I, I have no clue why they're laughing. I, what, what, did, I, did I crack a joke? Did I? <laughs> He's in touch with all of those things. He's in touch when, when, you, when you're in university, when you're at high school, and, and you just can't make it happen. And it could be that you're distracted at home. Parents are not available to you. You don't have the right tutors. You don't have the, the, the right resources. You, you just don't have, you don't have it all put together. Anybody understands what I'm talking about when you just don't have it all put together? Anybody in this room? Everything is just not lining up together in your life. God is in touch with you even in that circumstance. He's in touch with you when you have to pay some serious bills. Now, is there anybody in this room who understands what it means that, that, that when the end of the month comes, how many of you get paid twice a month? And, and you know, I know some of the young people, you're going to get paid at the end of this whole, whole experience, but, 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 but for those of you who get paid twice a month, at least you, get, you, you look at your, 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 your bank account and you recognize that, 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 that stuff has come in. But immediately after stuff has come in, it goes back out. It, it, it's a miracle. Is it not a miracle? It's, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's one of those miracles that, that we don't want to have happen in our lives. That very <laughs> same day, we get, we get our pay, and that very same day, a magic hand just removes all of what we have received. So, so the next day, you're like, well, didn't I get paid yesterday? Where did all the pay go? Something, a, a miracle has happened that, that, that what we got paid yesterday is all gone today. S somehow, somehow I need to understand why that miracle happens just about every month of our lives. Can somebody say amen today? Amen. Jesus is in touch with that, and he's in touch with all the circumstances of our lives. 
He is in touch by the, he's, he's touched by the feelings of our infirmities. And what that also means is that he's not, all, he's not just aware of what we're experiencing, but he senses the pain and he senses the fear and he senses the trauma via the, the experiences that you have. And that's why God is different from the other gods. The other gods uh, just want you to worship them, just want you to give, their, uh, give to them their, their, their obeisance and their allegiance. But God is saying, I don't just want all of that from you, but I need to let you know that I'm in touch with how you feel. I'm in touch with what you're going through. I understand your pain. I get your fear. I get your struggle. I get how you feel traumatized by this experience. I'm right there with you. I like Psalm 46, which says that, that he is a very present help in time of trouble. Anybody knows what very present means? What that simply means is that there is nothing that is so traumatizing to you that is further from you than God. What that means is that God is closest to you when you're experiencing that trauma. Are you all with me tonight? When you're experiencing fear, when you're experiencing pain, he is very present, and he's also a very present help in that time of need. Here are these individuals who are, are maimed. The Bible gives them uh, some descriptions. They, they are blind. They're maimed. They, they are lame. They are paralyzed. These are individuals who, for all intents and purposes, cannot do anything on their own. Here's this man. He's in the porticos, the five porticos, and, 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 and scholars say that, that these porticos were built just for the people who needed mercy because the system has failed them. The structures that have been created have now been broken. The, 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 the people and the individuals, the, the politicians and, 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 and the, the agencies that have been set up to support them through their maimed and lamed and paralyzed and blind experiences, they are not available to a system. Can I talk to somebody today? That's the reason why I mentioned to you just a few moments ago that Jesus is in touch with you. Because politicians will likely fail us. Pastors will likely fail us. Church leaders will likely fail us. Even our best friends might likely fail us when we're going through our circumstance. Are you all with me today? But there's only one person who will not fail us. There's only one person in whom we can place our trust, and that's Jesus Christ. The system had failed these people. And so the system them says, in order, for, in order for us to set them up in a way that they will be taken care of some, some way possible, we will set up these porticos so that they will have a place where they could hang out. Even more than that, they give this idea that an angel will come down and stir the waters, and the person who jumps in first will receive a healing blessing and be able to get up from their experience. For me, I feel that despite the fact that the system failed them and was broken, and the system had put them off in this idea of mercy, it was a veneer of care. Do you know how, how it feels when, when you know someone's faking it? They come up to you and they give you one of those fake smiles. You've heard that before. You've seen it before in your life. You know that they're not real for real. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? That they're just, they're just not real in your life. You, you, can't, you sense that they're inauthentic, that they're just not warm. And, and we've all experienced that, experienced that happening to us, but we've all also demonstrated that to other people. I want to think that this is exactly what these individuals were going through. That the system had failed them, and the system created a veneer of care. But did they really care? Was this a true demonstration of their care for these individuals? Were these five porticos, were these people who needed actual care, 24 care, was this really care for them? Or did this really demonstrate how sometimes we could be a part of a system that fails people by our forgetting that they actually exist? Are you all with me today? Here comes Jesus Christ. He's walking into this portico area. He knows that there are people that the system has failed. He knows that there are people who are sick. He knows that there are people who are maimed. They're 
paralyzed, they're broken, and he walks in there as if to say, the system might fail you, people might, 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 might truncate you, individuals might not care for you, people will turn their back on you, people will give you a veneer of their care, but I came to this portico to let people know that I not, I'm not just in touch with their feelings, but I also want to demonstrate that I care for them. Can I talk to somebody today? Jesus is not just in touch with how you feel when you experience your brokenness, but Jesus also cares because he walked in our shoes as human. He sat where we sat. He experienced trauma himself while he lived amongst us. The same struggles that we faced, he faced them too. The same temptations we, went through, we go through on a daily basis, Jesus went through. You know what the Word says? That He went through all of these temptations, yet without fault. So when you think that you're going through something by yourself, when you feel like you're going through a circumstance and you feel broken by yourself, I came to talk to somebody today and let you know that Jesus cares because He's also gone through it Himself. He comes to this area with these people, and he goes directly to a man. The man says to him this, the sick man, the sick, six man, the six, the, a certain man, the Bible says uh, in, in verse 5, that a certain man was there also who had his own infirmity. The Bible doesn't tell us what that infirmity was. Some scholars believe that he was blind, and so he couldn't see. Others believe that he had some other issue, but the, the Bible doesn't necessarily suggest what his infirmity was. The Bible simply says that he was sick, and he just could not help himself. He had an infirmity for 38 years. So the other day, we talked about the person who had the issue of blood for 12 years. Now, multiply that by several times. This gentleman is not just 12. He is now sick for 38 years. The Bible doesn't say that he was sick from the moment of his birth. We don't know if he had an accident. We don't know if he'd gone through an experience. We don't know if he fell from, 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 from a, a tall building and, and had an infirmity. We, we, we don't know what his history was. And brothers and sisters, that reminds me of, of the experience of us all when we become engaged with Jesus Christ. You know the trouble that I have with people when they, when they attend our churches, when they attend our, our fellowships? We are so interested in what happened 38 years ago. We're just not happy that a person has met Christ, that their lives have been changed, that their lives have seen or experienced a transformation, and now they have a smile on their face, and they're walking with such confidence in Christ because of what Christ has done for them and the new relationship that they have with Jesus Christ. You know what we spend our time on? Well, isn't this the person who, who, who was a drug addict? Isn't this the same person who last year was, was doing X, Y, Z? Wasn't this the same person who was with so and so and the two of them did X, Y, Z? We can go through a recounting of all the person's bad stuff. We have a PhD in writing about people's bad stuff. But you know what I like about Jesus? Jesus says, when, I, when you come to me I, and I take your sins from you, I, 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 I take them and I throw them into the depths of the sea. When he took your sins, he threw them into the depths of the sea. When he took my sins, he threw them into the depths of the sea. He says, I throw them there and I forget them, sorry, I remember them no more. But we like to go deep sea fishing. To dig back up people's past so that we can reflect on people's past as if to say that person has not completely forgiven themselves for the past that they had. Suggesting also that that past is more important than what that per person's future is all about. Well, brothers and sisters, my young friends, can I talk to somebody tonight? Jesus is not interested in your decline. He's not interested in what you did last year. 
He's not interested, and I feel like somebody's sleeping tonight, so I'm just going to preach to myself. He's not interested in what you did last year. He's not interested in what you did last month. He's not interested in what you did 20 years ago. He's not interested in what you did 38 years ago. He's interested in what he's about to do in your life beginning today. That's what he's interested in. He's interested in your future. He's interested in your destiny. He's interested in where he wants to set you up in terms of a path where he's going to direct your life. Jesus is not interested in your decline. He's interested in your incline. Can somebody say hallelujah tonight? So when Jesus walks into this, into this area where there are all kinds of people who are maimed, he walks directly to that individual, and he has a, a very short conversation with this person. And he asks him this question. Do you want to be made well? If Jesus walked in here and he, sa and he says, do you want to have some additional funding for all those bills that you keep accumulating every month, what would you say? If Jesus came into this room and says, well, this summer camp is done and you're no longer going to be a counselor in the next couple of weeks, do you want a job? What are you going to tell him? If you didn't grow up with a father and you didn't have that father figure in your life and Jesus came to you and says, do you want a father figure in your life? What are you going to say? Here's Jesus. This man has no clue who this man is. He, he, he's just seeing a weird guy coming up to him asking, me, asking him, what do you want? Brothers and sisters, when Jesus asks you what you want, you tell him what you want. Now, of course, there's a song that says, you know, Jesus on the main line, tell him what you all, none of you all know that song, but, but I'm going to repeat it for you anyway. He's on the main line, we tell him what we want, we call him up. Now we got, we got cell phones. Maybe we should need to adjust the song and say, Jesus is on my cell phone, tell him what, what, what you want. You call him up and tell him what you want. This man didn't come to Jesus and say to him, this is what I want. Jesus came to him. Jesus stepped into his reality. Jesus stepped into his place. Jesus came into his person. Jesus came into the space that he was in and says, hey, do you want to be made whole again? What do you want? And this is how the guy responds. Jesus, Jesus asks him the question, do you want to be made well? The gentleman, the sick man, the Bible says, answers and says, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. That's because this legend of an angel who came down to stir the water, this legend, would, the legend of the angel would stir the water, and he, in his belief that he, he knew that he would be healed at, right after the angel stirs the water. At least if someone puts him down into the water so that once the water is stirred and he's laid down or sent down into the water, he would be made well once again. Of course, he doesn't know that he's speaking to Jesus Christ himself. Of course, he doesn't know that he's speaking to the man Christ Jesus. He doesn't know that he's speaking to the great physician of the world. Jesus doesn't bother getting into any arguments with him. He gives him a, a direct command. He says, here's what, here's what he says. He says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And the man, of course, is not interested in an argument with Jesus. The Bible says that he immediately takes up his bed and he walks. Now, of course, in the next part of the chapter, you see people grumbling because it was on the Sabbath and, and you're not supposed to be doing good on the Sabbath. That's a sermon for another time. But watch this. John's interested. Are you all with me tonight? John's interested in demonstrating the deity of Jesus Christ. Read anywhere in the book of John. His conversation is all about Jesus Christ, man, but he's definitely God. You ask yourself, why did Jesus choose that experience to show what of Jesus, of his deity? The portico has water. Water is represented through what Jesus says to the woman at another 
place where water was, was drawn. In the previous chapter, he meets a Samaritan woman, and the Samaritan woman is, he's asking the Samaritan woman, hey, could you give me some water to drink? And they have this banter back and forth, and Jesus says to her, I, I want you to know that I've got some water better than this water. They, they have this tit for tat. And she's like, wait, 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 what? You can't be serious. This, this is the water that you need because you're thirsty. And Jesus is saying, you have no clue about the water that I have to give to you. This water that I have, when you drink it, it will be to you as a fountain of water springing up into your life. In other words, when you drink of this water, you will be changed from the crown of your head to the very sole of your feet. You'll be a different man. You'll be a different woman. This, this water is, is, is here represented by, by, by him saying that I am the water of life. You will never thirst anymore. You will be satisfied once you drink of this water. That was, in a sense, one of the reasons why this narrative is offered to us in this context. But the more I read in this narrative, are you all with me tonight? John not only wants his hearers to know that Jesus is deity, but he also wants his, his, his readers to know that he's God in the flesh, sent to save humanity. Let's back up again. Are you all with me tonight? Or are you bored tonight? Take your Bibles again. Look at what it says. He goes to Jerusalem. There in Jerusalem by the sheep gate. What were sheep used, sheep used for back then? Huh? Huh? What? What were sheep used for back then? then? Money. Uh-huh. Wh what else? Wool. Sacrifice. Two people said sacrifice. These sheep walked through the portico because they were on their way to being sacrificed. <laughs> Prior to these individuals Getting to be in this area where these porticos, these por the five porticos were, these pools, this is also a place where these sheep were washed before they were sacrificed. Are you with me today? No, you're all not with me today. <laughs> Everybody's tired from playing basketball and everything else. Uh, oh, boy. John wants people to know that Jesus is deity, the deity in the flesh, who comes to this earth to offer sacrifice, to go to the cross of Calvary. Oh, the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary to save humanity from sin. Oh, the blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. The same blood is not only available to change our lives, but this same blood is available to heal those who are maimed, to heal those who are broken, to heal those who are messed up, this same blood was shed on the cross of Calvary. He comes in this context, in this area where the sheep come to be washed through the port, the gate, the sheep gate, at a place of mercy so that he could offer mercy to each one of us there at the cross. This text is so rich identifying not just the experience of the man, but identifies the purpose of Christ who is sent to this wicked world to make atonement for humanity. And that atonement is offered to each one of us because of the death of Christ on the cross. 
And that sacrifice is offered, it's registered in God's Word. We read it, we cogitate on it. And our lives are changed by it, so much so that as our lives are changed, we could give ourselves fully and wholly and completely to that same man who walked into those five porticos and gave new life to this man who had 38 years of infirmity. Do you know what? That same man is in this room through the presence of his spirit. And that same spirit is pricking someone's heart tonight. Because you, my friend, need healing just like this man who had the infirmity for 38 years. Everyone in this room needs healing. Everyone in this room needs a change that can only come from the outside in. Because we can't change ourselves. We cannot heal ourselves any more like this man couldn't. We can't fix ourselves. We can't save ourselves. We can't make ourselves whole. We cannot transform ourselves. And if there's anybody in your life who says that they could, they're lying to you. If there's anybody in your life who says that they're righteous, they're also lying to you. There's nothing righteous about any of us. In fact, Isaiah says that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. But Christ Jesus is available today to offer forgiveness and healing and redemption. There's someone in this room who needs that. And only you know that of yourself. Only you understand that about you. As you look introspectively at your own heart, as you look at you, are you willing tonight to say, Jesus, I want that same transformation as you did with this gentleman? I want you to change me. I want you to fix me. I want you to make me whole.